And I also saw you pull up on your motorcycle. I was watching Will Smith's uh, interview. And I was just like, wow, this is cool. Most people understand spirituality as some kind of a disability. It's not a disability. <laughs> It is the greatest empowerment. How, how do you see dance fitting in this spiritual space? I think it's a fundamental responsibility because when you have the power to influence other people's lives, you must ensure that the influence is very positive. We come from a culture where all our gods dance. It's the exuberance of life, finding expression is dance. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure um, to be able to speak with you. Um, I've been uh, spiritual for as long as I can remember and um, it is just also interesting to be able to speak to uh, a spiritual guru like yourself. I found you um, like maybe a year and a half, two years yeah, ago. I never was lost. I never was <laughs> lost. How could you find me? <laughs> I, I uh, stumbled ac across, um, across you on YouTube and... Um, I always, I always, uh, I always thought you had a, a great personality, and um, you know that that's something that's important for you know a young developing spiritual person to be able to uh, connect and communicate uh, with an elder. So uh, I have uh, a lot of respect for you, and I just wanted to start by first saying that. Um, before I have some questions for you, um, how, how's your tour been going? A tour went great. Uh, Thirty-six days we were on the road on a motorcycle. It was a fantastic journey. It's been a long time since I rode like this, nearly 10,000 miles, 9,477 miles on the road <laughs> in 36 days. So it's wow. been a very long time since I rode like this and above all, meeting all the Native American nations, uh, traveling to them, meeting them. Well, uh, it was a bit restri restricted because of the, the virus uh, situation, but otherwise still we got to meet many people. And uh, we are in the process of, uh, you know, the most important thing is I want to make sure they're visible in the world. Unfortunately, they've become invisible. Uh, it was a major culture at one time, but, uh, you know, kind of disappeared. Uh, yeah. We want to put them back on the map, kind of. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. So, um, m what kind of motorcycle do you have? <laughs> uh, this time around, I rode a, uh, a K1600 GT. It's a BMW. It's oh, okay. A, it's a 1600 uh, touring bike, but it's a sport touring bike. So, it's quite nimble. It's not like the big Harleys or Indians, you know, right. it's not… It's not one heap of metal. It's uh, properly designed like a sports bike. Uh, but it's a touring bike. So how did you find um, um, exploring the Native American culture? Because, you know, uh, in, in my culture, you know, we always have a thing where it says, you know, you're Indian. See, some part of you, you're Indian. So, um, you know, that culture is, like you said, not so prevalent where, you know, there's so much information about uh, the different cultures and um the different, um, the variations of, of uh, Native Americans. So how did you find um, that experience? See, uh, for most uh, people in the world, their idea of, uh, their image of a Native American person is essentially from a Wild West movie. A bunch of young people on uh, barebacked horses, riding, hollering all the time and shooting at anybody who comes their way. That's a kind of unfortunate image that is there in most of the world because they have seen these people only in the Wild West movies. But uh, it was also eye-opening for me to realize that there were over 500 nations at one time in North America, just in the United States, 500 nations. And many of them had well-developed cities and uh, by choice they lived as hunters, gatherers, but there were cities a uh, place like Cahokia on the Mississippi uh, banks, uh, east of Mississippi, thousand years ago, they had a population of 40,000 people. So 40,000 people doesn't happen in one place unless there is substantial organization, administration, a whole system, all right? So they did all that. To give you a perspective, that a thousand years ago in London city, there were only 15,000 people. 
In Cahokia, there were forty thousand people. That is the level of uh, thing that was there. And each one of these nations or tribes have their own language, their own culture, their own spiritual process, their own type of rituals, everything. So unfortunately, this is not known to people because these are oral cultures and it goes from generation to generation and there's been such a massive dislocation in the last uh, eight, ten generations maybe. In the last two hundred years, there's been such a massive dislocation of their culture. So most of it is gone because it's not written down, it's not preserved as it is done in every other culture. This is purely an oral culture. If an elder dies and if the young people don't pick it up, it's like forty thousand... It is forty thousand years of history. Somewhere between twenty to forty thousand years ago, they have been here. Since then, there is archaeological proof for that. So this longer history is just lost. If one generation either dies of disease or war or something else happens, or, you know, whichever way it happens, which happened in the last two hundred years, and a whole lot of it, unfortunately, has been lost. But uh, still there are people who are uh, committed to keeping this alive and going. So my effort is to make them visible. People should know there are people like this. Right. Well, that's amazing. Um, I, uh... There has been a phenomenal response uh, across the world. Particularly in India, people had not even heard about these people. And uh, now there is such a big awareness and we are continuing to release more and more content about that. That's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah, um, like I was telling you, uh, you know, from where I'm from in my culture, we always have had um, a type of respect and admiration, even though a lot of these um, customs and cultures are hidden. You know, um, we we feel very much so uh, a part of it um, in a very um, interesting way, you know, uh, through, throughout my history. So um, I, I thought that that was really interesting. And, and I also saw you pull up on your motorcycle. I was watching Will Smith's uh, interview <laughs> and uh, I was just like, wow, this is cool. Uh, you know, a yogi, a guru that um, uh, I don't know, maybe people imagine that you know, you don't have certain freedoms in life um, because uh, being a yogi um, and a spiritual person is, um, is um, I don't want to say it is, is a job because obviously... <laughs> no, most people, most people understand spirituality as some kind of a disability. It's, right. <laughs> it's not a disability. It is, the, it is the greatest empowerment that you can ha have in your life. If it's yeah. a disability, I think it should be banned. Anything yeah. that disables a human being should be taken away. Why are we talking against drugs, alcohol, all this? Not because uh, we are against pleasure, we are against disability. In some way, it will bring disability. Because mm -hmm. human empowerment is in our abilities, enhancing our abilities, not in disabling ourselves. So if spirituality is a way of disabling yourself, <laughs> we must ban the damn thing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you say that because, um, you know, a lot of people here, they view karma, you know, uh, as a as kind of a type of punishment system. And I, I want to know, you know, what what is really the nature of karma, if you can express it? It's, uh, it's uncanny that you're asking this because coming uh, February, Random House is publishing a book by me on karma. <laughs> it's a, wow. The title is Karma. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> it is a uh, yogi's guide to freedom. What is karma? See, uh, to put it, uh, I will try to make it very concise. There could be, when you uh, kind of make it that brief, there could be loopholes. If you see the loophole, ask a question, otherwise it's fine. Most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so, the simple thing is this. See, right now you are who you are, including the shape, size, color of your body, everything is because of a certain memory carried within you. Right now, suppose you or me, you start eating dog's food or cow's food, the body won't get confused because there is evolutionary memory in this. You give it whatever you want, it only becomes a human being, isn't it? So this is only because of information, memory that is there across the system. Now, if you eat my food, if you eat my food, you will get enslaved to me, that's a different matter. 
okay? <laughs> I'm a good cook, I'm just threatening you <laughs> What you eat? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if you eat my kind of food, you will not uh, become an Indian, you will still remain an African-American person because there is genetic memory in you, all right? Similarly, there is genetic memory, there is karmic memory, there is conscious and unconscious memories, there is articulate and inarticulate levels of memories. Like this, there are various levels of memory stored within us. Right now, what you call as myself, even the way you sit and stand is because of memory. People think all these things won't work. See, when they're eighteen, they think they don't want to have anything to do with their parents. You watch them when they're forty-five, fifty, they... you will walk like your father, you will sit and stand like your father, you even begin to speak like him, you know? Because the genetic memory is inside playing its own uh, this thing. So this... all this memory makes you who you are. So now the question is, will you use all this memory as a stepping stone for a new possibility, or will you get trapped in this memory? If you get trapped in this memory, then we say, ayo karma. If you... if you stand upon this memory and reach out for a new possibility, then we call this liberation or a liberating process. So this choice everybody has, it is just that most people get trapped in their memory because they get identified with their memories. You know, right now, your identity or anybody's identity is with their memory. Right now, I can say I'm an Indian. From where? It's in my memory. If you wipe out my memory, I don't know whether I'm an Indian or what, isn't it? So everything is in memory. If you identify with your memory, then you get trapped in that memory. If you're not identified with it, if you're conscious and you handle your memory consciously, then karma is a tremendous possibility. It is a stepping stone for higher possibilities in life. Because only because of this vast amount of memory that we have gathered, right from being an amoeba till being this complex, uh, you know, sophisticated life that we are right now, the memory is all there within the system. All this memory is a tremendous possibility if we stand upon it like a stepping stone. But if you get trapped in it, then it'll put through cycles of the same thing. So in India, always it's like this, uh, you know, like <laughs> if in the Indian villages, if you meet somebody, they... they won't ask you, how are you doing, good morning, all this. They will just ask, uh, tingla. This means, have you eaten? Because their understanding is, if you have eaten, you should not have any other problem. Because the rest of the... the rest of the problems are your making. So if somebody has eaten well and sitting there sa with a sad face, then we say, ayo karma. That means, their memories are tormenting them, you know? Whether conscious memory or unconscious memory, or memories that you uh, can figure out what they are, or you know, memories that you don't know where they come from, but some memory is tormenting you right now. Then we say, ayo karma, because karma has become a trap. What should have been a stepping stone has become a trap. What should have been an empowerment has become, you know, kind of uh, taking away all the possibilities in your life. Wow. That is a really, really great uh, example because um, I was doing some research and I found that karma meant something different in your culture. And um, thank you for explaining that. I think that a lot of people feel that, um, you know, uh, the, the, the old saying, you know, you reap what you sow. And it's kind of that same concept, but you definitely uh, dived in to... Um, make clarity for me because um, on my journey, on my spiritual journey, I found that um, when I have uh, experienced um, experience things that I actually remember experiencing it. And it's almost like I told you so, or you knew that already kind of um, feeling um, after I, you know, uh, whether it be a performance or a moment in a performance or a, a dancing because um dancing is something very sp special to me and um spiritual for me and um i wanted to know uh how, how do you see dance fitting in this spiritual space <laughs> well uh i i i'm not i'm sorry i've not really seen you dancing but people told me you're a great dancer <laughs> <laughs> Check me out, man. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will check you out. 
I heard that tomorrow you're releasing some new album or something, I will check that out when you release it. The Connection. Uh-huh. Yeah, and um, it is it is uh, really, really cool. Um, one of my biggest... And let me say, say that, uh, no, you shouldn't say that yourself. I will watch it and tell you how cool it is. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, um, I, I, I recently got to um, travel to um, Michael Jackson's uh, estate here in, um, in the valley. They call it the Havenhurst um, um, Jackson estate. And um, I thought it was so amazing because the first concert that I ever went to as a child was a Michael Jackson concert. Mm -hmm. And I also got to um, me shake his hand, and he has influenced my life. Uh, you are supposed to shake a leg with him, huh? Not a hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was. You know what? He was shooting the video. I didn't get the chance to shake a leg. <laughs> but um, it was it was a very profound experience for me because I remembered um, I remembered uh, how much he's influenced my purpose in being a musician uh, a lot of a lot of people make music to sell records and i've done that you know i started at the uh, precious age of uh, 15 that's when i put out my first album uh, i'll be 36 um in a, in a, actually like two weeks um so my my purpose and my meaning for sharing and connecting with people all over the planet has uh continued to grow and change and it was so cool for my album, The Connection, to be able to go to the Havenhurst Estate and, um, you know, speak about his influence. So the album is um, a really meaningful album. And um, that's what I want to continue to do as an artist is uh, just continue to give people the tool to be positive and, and feel good with music. And um, one of the questions that I have was um, a, a lot of... Um, um, composing music, singing, dancing, and performing on stage um, is a spiritual thing. How can I tap into uh, deeper dim dimensions of that in my life? And um, Now you piled up two questions, one on top of another, man. Okay, the one. I'm sorry. <laughs> do the one first. I'm sorry, I got excited. <laughs> <laughs> now... Uh, See, Michael Jackson uh, had the power to inspire a whole generation of people. What he did was so unique and eye-catching anywhere in the world. I'm telling you, in the remotest part of India, in some village where there is no… nothing, they know Michael Jackson. I mean, that's a level of inspiration. He brought in a whole lot of youth dancing like him in India, <laughs> in imitation of him. So that was a powerful possibility, but… Uh, I'm sorry if I say something that hurts anybody, but I feel his life could have been, you know, he could have made this into really transforming the world in some way. But unfortunately, I feel no proper guidance around him, no proper advisors, and all commercial people, I think it went waste because just five days ago, I was at the Elvis Priestley's uh, uh, museum in Memphis. As a part of the journey, when we were coming back, we stopped at Memphis also went to Martin Luther King's, you know, that place where the assassination happened. So when I was at Elvis' place also, that's what I thought. He also, for two decades, he dominated the music scene, inspired a whole generation of people. But uh, his own life became a total mess because there is no proper uh, guidance, there is no balance. There is genius, but there is no balance. So... This is a sad story that's happened to a whole lot of uh, great uh, talent in the world, particularly in America, because uh, people grow up on all the wrong things at a very early age. When I say wrong things, there is chemical influence, there is alcohol, there is all kinds of distractions that we must understand this always, that our intelligence, our competence, our genius, all these things are important, but for all of them to find expression in the world, the most fundamental thing is balance. Now you're a dancer, you ask what is the significance of dance? You can be as good a dancer as you are, but if there is no stable platform, you're not going to dance, isn't it? This is all life is. Whatever our dance is, whether we're going to dance on stage or in the office or wherever, in whichever form our dance finds expression, 
in the world. The most important thing is a stable platform within ourselves, a balance. If this balance is missing, all talent, all competence, all genius, all... You know, whatever exuberant things you have will go waste. So, both these personalities, one that you mentioned, Michael Jackson and also Elvis Presley, are a classic example of this lack of balance when there is such a massive talent that you are capable of influencing an entire generation, not in one country, across the world. When you have that, this could have been used to really create a new generation of people, new sort of planet, actually. You can... you can do this, you had the power to do that. It is just the lack of balance. So I'm saying, uh, you, Omar Ian, you better dance your way as well as you can. Uh, whatever it is, maybe uh, it is not like everybody can be a Michael Jackson or we don't have to imitate that, but a new possibility in that sphere because music and dance has such a significant influence on the youth. But bringing balance to yourself and bringing balance to everybody who gets in touch with you, these millions of youth who get in touch with you, I think is a fundamental responsibility because when you have the power to influence other people's lives, you must ensure that the influence is very positive and it is towards their well-being, never against their well-being. So having said that, about... you asked about dance, what's the significance of dance? Woo! Come on now. <laughs> I was... come on now. That's... that's the truth. I'm sorry, but I had to just... <laughs> balance. This is so important. This is so important. So, in terms of dance, see, I must tell you this. Uh, we come from a culture where all our gods dance. Everywhere else, God is a serious guy, <laughs> very serious guy. But in India, if a man... if he doesn't dance, we won't treat him as a god. All Indian gods, male and female, always dance. Because if they can't dance, he can't be God. <laughs> because dance essentially means that life is happening at... see, dancing in a particular style is a different matter. If you do not know this, uh, my... my daughter is a full... you know, full-time classical dancer, Indian classical dancer. Uh, I took her off education and put her into this because it meant so much to us that, you know, what is dance is not just entertainment. So if you're doing a particular style of dance, it's one thing. Otherwise, even a child will get up and dance when it feels exuberant. It's the exuberance of life, finding expression is dance. When body cannot keep quiet, it wants to do something exuberant, it will dance. Well, you guys have... might have evolved your own kind of uh, styles and I don't know, you slide on the... Do you do all that like Michael Jackson <laughs> was doing? <laughs> Those are all, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you say, many methods of doing it. But essentially, it's the exuberance of the physical self that the best way the body can express itself is dance. The highest way the body can express itself is dance, actually, because that is the highest level of exuberance it finds. So, for this, also you know, balance is most important. If you want to dance well, the most important thing is balance. But most people dance only when they're drunk <laughs> We have a... a night-long festival once a year, nearly a million people. Last time, 870,000 people attended this event. And uh, it is telecast uh, nationwide in over hundred channels in India and all this. But uh, full night, from evening six to morning six, no alcohol, no drug, none of these things are, you know, anywhere come near us. But entire night, the whole crowd will sing and dance, okay? Wow, I have to see... I have <laughs> to see... something you must come and see. <laughs> yes, I, I'm... I'm I'll ask them to send you some videos. <laughs> yes, I, I have to... I have to experience this. Wow, that's... that's amazing. See, without the exuberance of uh, when your emotion becomes exuberant, maybe you will sing. I'm not saying a practice singer or a professional singer. When emotion becomes exuberant, people want to sing, even those who don't know anything to sing, they will also do something, hmm, hmm, hmm. You know, at least they will hum. When the physical self becomes very exuberant, it naturally dances. 
that's how it should be. Well, styles of dancing and other things are a different matter, there are culture in it, there is various aspects to it. But uh, essentially, dance is an outpouring of one's life's exuberance, life energy is exuberant. So, we don't consider somebody divine or godly unless their life energies are exuberant and overflowing. <laughs> <laughs> right, wow, that is so cool. Wow, thank you for that. That's <laughs> wow, that's amazing. So I wanna um I wanna ask about meditation. Um I find that um meditation has really uh helped me explore life and quiet, you know, the noise and um also om being the first two letters of my name, feeling connected to the om. Uh, it's really um, it's really brought me a lot of peace. I, I understand that this is an ancient practice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think that they don't have enough time to meditate, you know, because they have busy, busy schedules, but I have a busy schedule. So I always find time to uh, meditate. What is the importance of um, creative, creative people bringing uh, meditativeness into their daily lives, in your words? See, the English word meditation causes lots of confusion because different people do different things and say it's meditation. If... Uh, if it's in Indian languages, for every aspect there is a specific word describing that, okay? So we don't have that in English language. So let's put it this way, Ess essentially, if you become meditative, see, this is what happens in various practices we teach. If you sit here, your body's here, your mind is there, you are little away from it. That means there is a little space between you and the body, there is a little space between you and the mind. There are only two kinds of sufferings and disturbances in human life, physical suffering and mental suffering. Do you know any other kind of suffering? No. No, these are only two things. So if there is a little space between you and your body and you and your mind, once there is a space, this is the end of suffering. So once there is no fear of suffering, only when there is no fear of suffering, will you walk your life full stride. Otherwise, every step is a half a step because what will happen, what will happen is always holding human beings back. If you have an assurance, whatever happens, this is how I will be. If you have this assurance, you would walk your life full stride. So if you want to explore anything fully, in depth, if you want to touch profound dimensions of your life and in turn profound dimensions of activity or impactful activity that you create, see, because in our life there are only two things. When it comes to our experience, profoundness of experience is what we are looking for. When it comes to activity, the impactfulness of our activity is all we are looking for. There's really nothing else. You can say it in so many different ways, but this is all it is, profoundness of experience, impactfulness of activity, that's all there is to our lives. So, if activity has to be impactful, it's very important, our experience has to be profound. Otherwise, it'll be just little, you know, seasonal impacts may be there, flaky stuff, it'll come and go, that's not the point. If you really want to have impact over people, the most important thing is your experience of life must be profound. At least in that one dimension, it must be profound. Only then you can really cause impact. So investing in that direction, is it waste of time? It's a silly idea to think it's a waste of time. Everybody must invest time to make the experience of life very profound. If you want to make it profound in an unbridled way, the fear of suffering should go. Fear of suffering will go only when the, you have a little distance between you and body, between you and mind. For this, there is a simple process for yourself and all your people, you can promote this, it's free of cost, it's available to everybody. It's called Isha Kriya, I-S-H-A Kriya. It's available, Isha Kriya. I'm about to write this down, go ahead. Yeah, it's available for everyone. Right now, millions of people around the world are practicing it. It's a simple process that everybody I'm can sorry. do. I'm sorry? I-S-H-A, Isha. Okay. Kriya, K-R-I-Y-A. Okay. Yes. This is a simple thing that you can do to bring little distance between yourself and your instruments of work on this planet. 
The only way you can do anything in this world is because you have a body and a, you have a mind. If you lose any one of them, you can't do it, all right? right? People are trying to lose it every Saturday evening, they think they're living. But actually, they're trying to lose their body and their mind. <laughs> yes. yes, the reason... the reason why they're trying to lose it is, five days of the week, they've suffered their mind. Mm. Two days, they want to drown it in alcohol and preserve it for future. Mm. <laughs> wow. If you were not suffering your mind, you wouldn't want to intoxicate it, right? Right. Yeah, that's true. If, if you were really enjoying the nature of your mind, would you want to slow it down? Would you want to turn it off? Everybody is talking about turning off the mind. Why is it a such a torture? Because you have not learned to use it. Because the nature of the mind is like this. If I ask you, do you want a sharp mind or a blunt mind, what is your choice? Sharp. Sharp. So sharp. if you... if I give you a very sharp knife, and if you do not know how to hold it, if you hold... hold the blade side of it, the harder you hold it, the more you will hurt, right? So because you don't know how to handle it, you want to slow it down, you want to put it off, <laughs> somebody wants to completely destroy it, because you did not learn how to handle it. Because to bring a human being to this level of cerebral capability, it took millions of years of evolution, and now human beings are suffering their evolution, unfortunately. They want to live like grasshoppers. Wow. Wow. Woo! So I'm definitely going to uh, check out this, and let me make sure I, I'm saying it right. Ishi Ka... Ka Isha. Isha. I-S-H-A, Isha. I-S-H-A-K-R-I-Y-A. I -I okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, because you're Omarian, there is also Am Mary. It is not to be said as Om, it is Am. It is just mm. three sounds. If you... see, these are not things that you just make up. If you open your mouth and exhale, you will do ah. If you partially close your mouth and exhale, you'll do oh. If you close your mouth and exhale, you will do mmm. If you combine these three in equal proportions, you will do ah. So this is not something that we made up, this is the basis of physical existence in this solar system. Now, uh, we've been saying this forever for thousands of years, but people were debating it. Now, you know, students from the University of Sheffield measured the reverberations around the sun, and they found the sun is constantly throwing out reverberations, which is arm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for this. Um, I just have a few more questions. And um, one of my questions was, um, how do you think that the young people can focus on their growth and well-being uh, rather than, you know, these momentary um, topics like um, you know, Birkin bags or, or buying material things. Um, how can um, people focus, young people focus on uh, their well-being? See, when we say young people, we are trying to as address them as a separate unit in the cultural milieu of a particular society. It will not work like that. Suddenly, you cannot say, young people must fix themselves, when the older generation has not fixed themselves, all right? Okay. <laughs> I'm saying... Uh, <laughs> see, whatever... See, it is like this. There... I, I'm just saying this as an example, this is not my opinion. For example, some time ago in this country, there was prohibition, all right? Nobody drinks alcohol. That was the intention. For whatever reasons, they had done that. Now people started drinking and making illegal stuff, moonshining and bootlegging. You know, I'm from... we are in Tennessee, this was the center of those things quite a bit at one time. So, then people started drinking, they made it legal. They made it legal not because it's a good thing. They made it legal because anyway the government could not control the production and sale of alcohol. So they thought it's better to tax it and make money at least, all right? So they made it legal. 
Now everybody started smoking weed. Now they made it legal, not because they think it's a good thing, simply because they're not able to control it. In every backyard they're growing it and they're using it. So what is the point? Better make money out of it at least. So how long do you think it'll take for us to make cocaine legal, meth legal, it'll all happen. Wow. Yes, if it becomes widespread, everybody's using it, if it becomes like that, government may to make it legal because people in the government also may be using it, they've admitted sometimes, <laughs> I'm saying. Yeah. So essentially, if you… at that time it was, uh, let's say in two generations ago, after your eighteenth birthday, you had your first uh, drink. Yeah. yeah. So if your father had it at eighteen, you thought you can have it at fifteen. Your son thinks he can have it at twelve. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right? I'm saying because this is the nature of the next generation, they always want to be one step ahead. If you… if your father was meditating, uh, he started at eighteen, you would look at him and see and say, at fifteen, maybe you want to meditate. Yeah, yeah. Your son wants to meditate when he's twelve. Maybe your grandson wants to meditate when he's a child, because I see in India, children are sitting like this and meditating is amazing. They're sitting like that for long periods of time. I'm talking about four, five-year-old kids, because they see their parents doing this. So yeah. culture just cannot be focused on one, one segment of the population. When you think the, uh, the older generation can do all this, the younger generation will be one step ahead of you. They will not be behind you for sure. Yeah. So it is… it is not right to say younger generation must be fixed. Younger generation is just following in the footsteps of the older generation, but definitely they would like to overtake them, you know, they like to pass them. They don't want to be behind them in their shadows. So they are going ahead of them. If you drank at eighteen, I drank at twelve, what is the big problem? You were proudly smoking and blowing it in everybody's face in seventies and eighties. Now if your son comes smoking home at the age of twelve, you f you're shocked. Right. <laughs> right. So I'm saying the cultural change needs to happen in a different way. Well, that is not an overnight thing, it's a life… you know, it's a generational work we have to do. For example, people campaigned against smoking continuously for twenty years. Today you see in United States, nobody is blowing smoke in your face anymore. Otherwise, could you walk into any restaurant or any place without being smoke-filled? But still in many parts of the world, it's still the same thing, everybody is smoking all the time, anywhere and everywhere, all right? So it took a twenty-year campaign to do that. Well, that campaign had legal, social and other, uh, you know, elements to it, but I'm talking about a constant campaign uh, needed in a society as what is it that will enable us? What is it that enhances our life? And what is it that diminishes our life? Let me tell you this, right now, in India also, this whole thing is picking up and you know, I, I was in Bangalore. These days I'm being invited for these uh, under twenty-five conferences because they think I'm under twenty-five <laughs> <laughs> They think I'm under twenty-five just disguised like this, you know <laughs> I mean, with the skin is glowing, you know, I might say so. So, uh, I was there and, uh, you know, like uh, about fifteen thousand people are there, all young people. And uh, I can hear, I can s feel the smell of marijuana out there. And uh, they asked me, Sadhguru, you have so much influence in the government, why don't you make marijuana legal for us? I said, uh, why not? Why just marijuana? Let's go all the way. Let's make cocaine legal. Let's make meth legal. Let's make LSD legal. Whatever you name it. Let's make everything legal one shot. Why go one at a time? Because if we make marijuana legal, marijuana people are happy. LSD people will be unhappy. They'll say, why don't you make ours legal? Let's make everything legal. So what is the intention? You guys are all in the university. You want to go to the university smoked up, is it? I asked. They said, why not? I said, we'll do one thing. I will take you on a s small plane ride, not a big commercial airline, small plane, single engine plane. But the pilot comes and he's all smoked up. You want to fly with him? He said, ah, ah, like this. They can't decide. Then I say, okay, you're not getting it. You need a major surgery. But the surgeon comes smoked up. You want the surgery? They said, oh no. 
So you clearly understand, in some way your faculties are impaired, all right? You clearly understand that. So what makes you think you can smoke up and go to the university? Should you be at your best or should you be at any less? So I want you to understand, when you smoke up, you are not high, you are low. So from now on, don't use this word high. You say, I smoke and I'm low. Let's see how long you want to be low. See, you're using all the wrong words. You get drunk and you say you're high, you're drugged up and you say you're high, you're not high, you're low. Because all your faculties have come down, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Just the wrong interpretations in the society, you think this is the way to be high. No, this is the way you become low. The moment you say, do you want to be low, you can... can you go and tell your friend, come, let's go get low. He'll say, no. You say, let's get high. He's saying, yes. So how to get high? You cannot get high without enhancing human faculties. By depreciating human faculties, you do not get high, absolutely, isn't it? Wow. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> you got a... you got a bigger knot than me on my... on your head, man <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you thro <laughs> throwing your dreadlocks around on the stage or what? <laughs> of course. No, I'm like, hey! <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay, yeah, so, um... Um, so what, what can young people in the music industry do to create uh, the kind of music and the kind of life uh, that is... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I asked that question. I wanted to ask, uh, how to inspire you to focus on... Okay, this is a question that I have. So because the, the country is so divided uh, now more than ever, and people are finding ways to uh, constantly segregate and divide themselves, some artists like uh, Bob Marley and MJ talked about the universal love in their music and their message. And, you know, that music is, is truly uh, timeless. Can music really uh, be a driving force to bring about this universal love during these crazy times? And um, what, what do you think about that? Because that's definitely my intention is to, you know, remind people throughout this life experience that, I feel that, you know, isn't um, smooth selling, you know, you have to come into the knowledge of, uh, of, of uh, knowing what you want. And I, I feel like pe everyone is striving for some type of happiness, but they don't know how to maintain it. Um, how do you think that artists can connect to this purpose? There are various aspects to this. One thing is initially you asked this question about how a musician can bring about this change. See, it's not necessary... don't even have a concept of a universal love or something, because if everybody on the streets start loving you, if the bugs in the tree start loving you, you'll have a little bit of problem, all right? right. What we want is that you are able to accept and respect every other life and even inanimate things, to have that regard and respect for everything because the soil that you walk upon, the water that you drink, the air that you breathe, the food that you eat, this is what you are, all right? You have not seen any other force creating you, these are the things which are making you happen. So similarly, every other life, to accept them the way they are and to have respect and regard for who they are and whatever they are. They have different purposes, different sort of people, you can't go and do lovey-dovey with everybody, all right? but you can accept and respect them for who they are, that, that is most important. So in terms of music, I must tell you my experience of music. I grew up in sixties, early seventies, where it's all rock and roll and like this. My parents were steeped in classical music, Indian classical music is something I ask uh, Tina or Vinod to send something to you to listen so that, you know, you just get an idea what I'm talking about. They are steeped in it, but you know, we are rock and roll. Why I am saying this is, See, the Western music, the way it is, now you are in what, some rhythm, what? I like blues, but I, you, they said something about your music, what is this? R&B. R&B. Yeah, rhythm, rhythm and, and blues. blues, is it? Yes. I'm a B.B. King fan, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love B.B. King. <laughs> and Magic Slim. <laughs> I 
I got to do some research on Magic Slim. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, this rhythm, the, when we were growing up, the rock and roll, though it is quite violent in its expression, yeah. it gets your body moving. You know, you can't help it, your body rocks with it. So there are… there is a certain type of music which moves your body, which does certain things to you, which brings out certain passions and certain ways of expression. I'm not trying to… Uh, you know, I'm not somebody who judges anything in terms of moral values. I'm just saying this is what it does. But it once happened, I was uh, riding, you know, it was um, the university in Mysore city, I was just riding on my motorcycle and going. Suddenly I heard some very powerful, strange kind of sound that I'd never heard. It kind of got me in the gut, literally in the gut, you know, it just pulled me there. I went there, it was a small amphitheater. This amphitheater is a place where, you know, all the steps up and down, we ride our motorcycles up and down these steps, that's why we go there. But today some small concert is happening, just about two hundred people or something like that is there. And I see some instrument, a strange instrument that I've never seen, some guys playing. And it just got me like that. I sat on my motorcycle and listened with tears welling up in my eyes. Then I… Ch later on I checked out, this is a, a instrument called Rudra Veena. You know, you can look it up. It plays very slowly. It's not any rhythm or anything. Like if he… you know, if he strums it once, he will wait for seconds. Dong, and they'll wait, wait, wait before the next one and the next one like this it is. Very slow. It just got me by the gut. Till then, I never was willing to listen to classical music. But after this, not by choice, by compulsion, <laughs> I listened to classical music. Now we are, uh, you know, I am… Uh, I am the source of conducting various classical music festivals in uh, India <laughs> because, <laughs> wow, cool. because the impact it has on you is such that it makes you go still. It doesn't make you move. You still… You, you, if you sit there with your eyes you close, uh, with your eyes closed and listen, it just makes your body still. It will not let you move. So, you can create music towards a meditative purpose. I will ask him to send you a series of music, you listen to it and see how you can adapt it to your style of whatever, the basis of that, you know. It's not that you have to play that kind of music, yeah, but yeah. you can use that basis to bring that when people listen to you. Yes, they need to dance, yes, they need to enjoy that. At the same time, they should also learn because all movement comes from, from our stillness. All sound comes from silence. Yeah. Without silence, there is no sound. Without stillness, there is no movement. If people do not know the power of stillness, they will always be compulsive. Yeah. So all these things which taking youth down right now is their compulsiveness. And their compulsiveness is encouraged and celebrated by a whole lot of people. They think being compulsive is passionate. It's not passion, yeah. it is just compulsive. So the entire process of, you know, like you come from a community, which has been in slavery at one time. What does slavery mean? Somebody compels you to do something that you don't like to do. So whether the compulsion happened from outside or from within, me being happy or unhappy is decided by somebody else within me. Is this not slavery? Because what happens within me if you can decide, this is slavery, isn't it? When people decide what should happen around us, that itself is horrible slavery. When what happens within you is determined by just about anything around you, this is the worst kind of slavery. If you do not liberate populations from this slavery, or in other words, if people do not understand human experience blossoms from within us, not from around us. Unless they experience this, being joyful by our own nature, being blissful by our own nature will not happen. Unless that happens, the fear of suffering is what controls and rules the society. That is why everything else in the world, the biggest investment in the world is the gun and the bomb and the works, because fear is the basis of human control right now. Not our joy, not our sense, not our intelligence, not our love, but fear is the basis. If this has to go, the most important thing is, our experience should not be determined by anything else. What happens hap 
have within me must happen because of me, not because of something else. Thank you so much, Sadhguru. And I really, <laughs> really appreciate speaking with you. Um, I'm actually um, writing a book now as well. Um, and it is my experience, um, you know, in the, in the music industry and also this spiritual journey that I've embarked on. And um, it would just be an honor, you know, those bits that you spoke about in reference to dance and um, what that means, you know, to the body and freeing itself. If, if I could get like, you know, a foreword or a quote from you, that would be... That would I'll be do that. Amazing. I'll do that for you and also I'll ask them to send you the karma book because the first question you asked is about karma. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, thank you so much. And uh, I will definitely see the... what is that tomorrow's launching, is it? What do you call that? Is that oh, uh, the connection, the music. Yeah, is it, you're releasing it tomorrow, okay. Yes. yes so, where does it go? It goes on YouTube, it goes where? Yeah, so um, it's gonna... we're premiering uh, the thing that I was telling you about going to the estate uh, tomorrow and we're also releasing the album. So it'll be everywhere. Um, pretty okay. much probably like late tonight. So yeah, it will be, it will be out tomorrow. I shot some videos. Um, I directed some videos. Um, yeah. When, when you get a moment, I'll send you some stuff, uh, you know, that you can, you can check out, but I definitely Please do that. I would, I would like to see that. Yeah. I would, I would, uh, I started in a group and then I became a solo artist and um, yeah, I would like to just share some things with you um, and, and keep in contact with you. And, yes. you know, maybe, you know, when I get a moment to come fly out there and, and check out that, uh, that uh, ceremony. You must, come to, you must come to Tennessee. We have a wonderful place out here. Okay. We are in uh, Cumberland Plateau. Okay. It's a 4,000 4, acre property, beautiful forested land. Oh, wow. Uh, very nice. You must come. I'm here till end of December. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to... Um, you know what? I have one more question, just one more question. What, <laughs> what, 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 do, you, what do you think about uh, psilocybin and um, the mushroom? I'm sorry? What do I think about? The mushroom. Oh, in Tennessee, uh, people, especially women, are very reputed to use mushroom to, uh, you know, end... Uh, their spouse's life, at least the jokes go... At, le <laughs> at least the jokes... at least the jokes go like that. <laughs> okay. There are okay. lots of mushroom here, you can come. Okay. But we won't... we won't give it to you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shagru. It is such a pleasure. And I hope to speak with you again. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, we'll catch up. Please come by, by before end of December. If you come, I'll see you here. Hmm? Okay. Thank you so <laughs> much. It is a pleasure. <laughs> you. Can't wait to meet you. Yeah. All the best for your tomorrow's release. <laughs> Thank you so much. And all the best for it for the book as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>